In this video, I'll talk about a different way of learning sigmoid belief nets. This different method arrived in an unexpected way. I stopped working on sigmoid belief nets and went back to Boltzmann machines and discovered that restricted Boltzmann machines could actually be learned fairly efficiently. Given that a restricted Boltzmann machine could efficiently learn a layer of nonlinear features, it was tempting to take those features, treat them as data, and apply another restricted Boltzmann machine to model the correlations between those features. And one could continue like this, stacking one Boltzmann machine on top of the next one, to learn lots of layers of nonlinear features. This eventually led to a big resurgence of interest in deep neural nets. The issue then arose, once you've stacked up lots of restricted Boltzmann machines, each of which is learned by modeling the patterns of feature activities produced by the previous Boltzmann machine, do you just have a set of separate restricted Boltzmann machines, or can they all be combined together into one model? Now anybody sensible would expect that if you combined a set of restricted Boltzmann machines together to make one model, what you get would be a multi-layer Boltzmann machine. However, a brilliant graduate student of mine called Yi Tay figured out that that's not what you get. You actually get something that looks much more like a sigmoid belief net. This was a big surprise. It was very surprising to me that we'd actually solved the problem of how to learn deep sigmoid belief nets by giving up on it and focusing on learning undirected models like Boltzmann machines. Using the efficient learning algorithm for restricted Boltzmann machines, it's easy to train a layer of features that receive input directly from the pixels. We can then treat the patterns of activation of those feature detectors as if they were pixels and learn another layer of features in a second hidden layer. We can repeat this as many times as we like, with each new layer of features modeling the correlated activity in the features in the layer below. It can be proved that each time we add another layer of features, we improve a variational lower bound on the log probability that some combined model would generate the data. The proof is actually complicated, and it only applies if you do everything just right, which you don't do in practice. But the proof is very reassuring because it suggests that something sensible is going on when you stack up restricted Boltzmann machines like this. The proof is based on a neat equivalence between a restricted Boltzmann machine and an infinitely deep belief net. So here's a picture of what happens when you learn two restricted Boltzmann machines, one on top of the other, and then you combine them to make one overall model, which I call a deep belief net. So first we learn one Boltzmann machine with its own weights. Once that's been trained, we take the hidden activity patterns of that Boltzmann machine when it's looking at data, and we treat each hidden activity pattern as data for training a second Boltzmann machine. So we just copy the binary states to the second Boltzmann machine, and then we learn another Boltzmann machine. Now one interesting thing about this is that if we start the second Boltzmann machine off with W2 being the transpose of W1, and with as many hidden units in H2 as there are in V, then the second Boltzmann machine will already be a pretty good model of H1, because it's just the first model upside down. And for a restricted Boltzmann machine, it doesn't really care which you call visible and which you call hidden. It's just a bipartite graph that's learned a model. After we've learned those two Boltzmann machines, we're going to compose them together to form a single model and the single model looks like this. Its top two layers are just the same as the top restricted Boltzmann machine. So that's an undirected model with symmetric connections. But its bottom two layers are a directed model, like a sigmoid belief net. So what we've done is we've taken the symmetric connections between V and H1, and we've thrown away the upgoing part of those, and just kept the downgoing part. To understand why we've done that is quite complicated and that will be explained in video 13f. The resulting combined model is clearly not a Boltzmann machine because its bottom layer of connections are not symmetric. It's a graphical model that we call a deep belief net where the lower layers are just like sigmoid belief nets and the top two layers form a restricted Boltzmann machine. So it's a kind of hybrid model. If we do it with three Boltzmann machines stacked up we'll get a hybrid model that looks like this. The top two layers again are a restricted Boltzmann machine, and the layers below 
are directed layers like in a sigmoid belief net. To generate data from this model, the correct procedure is, first of all, you go backwards and forwards between H2 and H3 to reach equilibrium in that top-level restricted Boltzmann machine. This involves alternating Gibbs sampling, where you update all of the units in H3 in parallel, then update all of the units in H2 in parallel, then go back and update all of the units in H3 in parallel, and you go backwards and forwards like that for a long time until you've got an equilibrium sample from the top-level restricted Boltzmann machine. So the top-level restricted Boltzmann machine is defining the prior distribution over H2. Once you've done that, you simply go once from H2 to H1 using the generative connections W2, and then whatever binary pattern you get in H1, you go once more to get generated data using the weights W1. So we're performing a top-down pass from H2 to get the states of all the other layers, just like in a sigmoid belief net. The bottom-up connections shown in red at the lower levels are not part of the generative model. They're actually going to be the transposes of the corresponding weights. So they're the transpose of W1 and the transpose of W2. They're going to be used for inference, but they're not part of the model. Now, before I explain why stacking up Boltzmann machines is a good idea, I need to sort out what it means to average two factorial distributions. And it may surprise you to know that if I average two factorial distributions, I do not get a factorial distribution. What I mean by averaging here is taking a mixture of the distributions. So you first pick one of the two at random, and then you generate from whichever one you picked. So you don't get a factorial distribution. Suppose we have an RBM with four hidden units. And suppose we give it a visible vector. Then given this visible vector, the posterior distribution over those four hidden units is factorial. And let's suppose the distribution was that the first and second units have a probability of 0.9 of turning on, and the last two have a probability of 0.1 of turning on. What it means for this to be factorial is that, for example, the probability that the first two units will both be on in a sample from this distribution is exactly 0.81. Now suppose we have a different input vector V2, and the posterior distribution over the same four hidden units is now 0 0.1, 0 0.1, 0 0.9, 0 0.9 which I chose just to make the math easy. If we average those two distributions, the mean probability of each hidden unit being on is indeed the average of the means for each distribution. So the means are 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, but what you get is not a factorial distribution defined by those four probabilities. To see that, consider the binary vector 1, 1, 0, 0 over the hidden units. In the posterior for V1, that has a probability of 0.9 to the 4, because it's 0.9 times 0.9 times 1 minus 0.1 times 1 minus 0.1. So that's 0.43. In the posterior for V2, this vector is extremely unlikely. It has a probability of 1 in 10,000. If we average those two probabilities for that particular vector, we'll get a probability of 0.215. And that's much bigger than the probability assigned to the vector 1, 1, 0, 0, by a factorial distribution with means of 0.5. That probability would be 0.5 to the power of 4, which is much smaller. So the point of all this is that when you average two factorial posteriors, you get a mixture distribution that's not factorial. Now let's look at why the greedy learning works. That is, why it's a good idea to learn one restricted Boltzmann machine and then learn a second restricted Boltzmann machine that models the patterns of activity in the hidden units of the first one. The weights of the bottom-level restricted Boltzmann machine actually define four different distributions. Of course, they define them in a consistent way. So the first distribution is the probability of the visible units given the hidden units. And the second one is the probability of the hidden units given the visible units. And those are the two distributions we use for running our alternating Markov chain that updates the visibles given the hiddens and then updates the hiddens given the visibles. If we run that chain long enough, we'll get a sample from the joint distribution of V and H, and so the weights clearly also define the joint distribution. They also define the joint distribution more directly in terms of e to the minus the energy, but for nets with a large number of units, we can't compute that. If you take the joint distribution, P of V and H, and you just ignore V, 
we now have a distribution for H. That's the prior distribution over H defined by this restricted Boltzmann machine. And similarly, if we ignore H, we have the prior distribution over V defined by the restricted Boltzmann machine. Now we're going to pick a rather surprising pair of distributions from those four distributions. We're going to define the probability that the restricted Boltzmann machine assigns to a visible vector V as the sum over all hidden vectors of the probability it assigns to H times the probability of V given H. This seems like a silly thing to do, because defining P of H is just as hard as defining P of V. Nevertheless, we're going to define P of V that way. Now, if we now leave P of V given H alone, but learn a better model of P of H, that is, learn some new parameters that give us a better model of P of H, and substitute that in instead of the old model we had of P of H, we'll actually improve our model of V. And what we mean by a better model of P of H is a prior over H that fits the aggregated posterior better. The aggregated posterior is the average over all vectors in the training set of the posterior distribution over H. So what we're going to do is use our first RBM to get this aggregated posterior and then use our second RBM to build a better model of this aggregated posterior than the first RBM has. And if we start the second RBM off as the first one upside down, it will start with the same model of the aggregated posterior as the first RBM has. And then if we change the weights, we can only make things better. So that's an explanation of what's happening when we stack up RBMs. Once we've learned a stack of Boltzmann machines and combined them together to make a deep belief net, we can then actually fine-tune the whole composite model using a variation of the wake sleep algorithm. So we first learn many layers of features by stacking up RBMs, and then we want to fine-tune both the bottom-up recognition weights and the top-down generative weights to get a better generative model. And we can do this by using three different learning rules. First, we do a stochastic bottom-up pass, and we adjust the top-down generative weights of the lower layers to be good at reconstructing the feature activities in the layer below. That's just as in the standard wake-sleep algorithm. Then, in the top-level RBM, we go backwards and forwards a few times, sampling the hiddens of that RBM and the visibles of that RBM and the hiddens of that RBM and so on. So that's just like the learning algorithm for RBMs. And having done a few iterations of that, we do contrastive divergence learning. That is, we update the weights of the RBM using the difference between the correlations when activity first got to that RBM and the correlations after a few iterations in that RBM. We take that difference and use it to update the weights. And then the third stage, we take the visible units of that top-level RBM, i.e. its lower layer of units, and starting there, we do a top-down stochastic pass using the directed lower connections, which are just a sigmoid belief net. Then, having generated some data from that sigmoid belief net, we adjust the bottom-up weights to be good at reconstructing the feature activities in the layer above. So that's just the sleep phase of the wake-sleep algorithm. The difference from the standard wake-sleep algorithm is that that top-level RBM acts as a much better prior over the top layers than just a layer of units which are assumed to be independent, which is what you get in a sigmoid belief net. Also, rather than generating data by sampling from the prior, what we're actually doing is looking at a training case, going up to the top-level RBM, and just running a few iterations before we generate data. So now we're going to look at an example where we first learn some RBMs, stacking them up, and then we do contrastive wake sleep to fine-tune it, and then we look to see what it's like as a generative model and also for recognizing things. So first of all, we're going to use 500 binary hidden units to learn to model all 10 digit classes in images of 28 by 28 pixels. Once we've learned that RBM, without knowing what the labels are, so it's unsupervised learning, we're going to take the patterns of activity in those 500 hidden units that they have when they're looking at data, we're going to treat those patterns of activity as data, and we're going to learn another RBM that also has 500 units.
and those two are learned without knowing what the labels are. Once we've done that, we'll actually tell it the labels. So the first two hidden layers are learned without labels, and then we add a big top layer and we give it the 10 labels. And you can think that we can catenate those 10 labels with the 500 units that represent features, except that the 10 labels are really one softmax unit. Then we train that top level RBM to model the concatenation of the softmax unit for the 10 labels with the 500 feature activities that were produced by the two layers below. Once we've trained the top level RBM, we can then fine tune the whole system by using contrastive wake sleep. And then we'll have a very good generative model. And that's the model that I showed you in the intro video. So if you go back and you find the introduction video for this course, you'll see what happens when we run that model. You'll see how good it is at recognition, and you'll also see that it's very good at generation. In that introductory video, I promised you you would eventually explain how it worked. And I think you've now seen enough to know what's going on when this model is learned. In this video, I'm going to show how we can first learn a deep belief net by stacking up restricted Boltzmann machines. And then we can treat that as a deep neural net that we fine tune discriminatively. So instead of fine tuning it to be better at generation, as we did in the previous video, we're going to fine tune it to be better at discriminating between classes. This works very well and led to a big renewal of interest in neural networks. In speech recognition, it's had a major influence and many leading groups are now switching to using deep neural nets in order to reduce the error rate in speech recognition. I now want to talk about fine-tuning these deep networks to be better at discrimination. So we first learn one layer of features at a time by stacking up restricted Boltzmann machines. Then we treat this as pre-training that finds a good initial set of weights in a deep neural network, and we fine-tune those weights using some local search procedure. In the previous video, I showed you how to use contrastive wake sleep to fine-tune a deep network so that it was better at generating its inputs. In this video, we're going to use backpropagation to fine-tune a model to be better at discrimination. If we do this, it overcomes many of the standard limitations of backpropagation. It makes it much easier to learn deep nets, and it makes those nets generalize better. We need to understand why backpropagation works better when we pre-train the weights. And there's really two effects. There's an effect on optimization, and there's an effect on generalization. So the pre-training scales really well if we have big networks, especially if each layer has locality. So if we're doing vision, for example, and we have local receptive fields in each layer, then there's not much interaction between widely separate locations. And so it's very easy to learn a big layer more or less in parallel. When we do pre-training, we don't start backpropagation until we've already learned sensible feature detectors. And these feature detectors should be very helpful for discrimination. So the initial gradients are much more sensible than if we use random weights. And backpropagation doesn't need to do a global search. It just needs to do a local search from a sensible starting point. In addition to being easier to optimize, pre-trained nets exhibit much less overfitting. That's because most of the information in the final weights comes from modeling the distribution of input vectors. And these input vectors, if you're dealing with something like images, generally contain a lot more information than labels. A label typically only contains a few bits of information to constrain the mapping from input to output, whereas an image contains a lot of information which will constrain any generative model of a set of images. The information in the labels is only used for the final fine tuning. And because by that stage we've already decided on the feature detectors, we're not squandering that precious information designing feature detectors from scratch. The fine tuning only makes slight changes to the feature detectors we learned in the generative pre training phase. And those are the changes required to get the category boundaries in the right place. The important thing is the back propagation is not being required to discover new features, and so it doesn't need nearly as much labeled data. In fact, this type of learning works well when most of the data is unlabeled, 
because the generative pre-training can make use of all that data. The unlabeled data is still very useful for discovering good features. There is an obvious objection to this kind of learning, which is that when we do generative pre-training, we'll be learning lots of features that are useless for the particular discriminative task we want the net to do. Consider, for example, that you might want the net to discriminate between shapes, or you might want the net to discriminate between different poses of one shape. They need very different features. And if you don't know the task in advance, you'll inevitably learn features that are never used. When computers were much smaller, that was a serious objection. But now that computers are large enough, we can afford to learn features that are never used. And we can afford it because among all the features we learn, there will be some that are much more useful than the raw inputs. And that more than makes up for the fact that we've learned some features that aren't helpful for the particular task we're interested in. So let's apply this to modeling the MNIST digits. We'll now learn three hidden layers of features entirely unsupervised. Once we've done that learning, when we generate from the model, it will generate things that look like real digits. And it'll generate them from all the different classes. And it'll typically take a while before it switches from one class to another. And it will typically take a while before it switches from one class to another, because it'll tend to stay in the same ravine for a while before it jumps to another ravine. But the question is, are the features that we've learned that way useful for doing discrimination? So all we need to do is add a final 10-way softmax at the top and fine-tune it with backpropagation and see if we do better than purely discriminative training. So here's the results on the permutation invariant MNIST task. And what I mean by permutation invariant is if we were to apply a fixed random permutation to all the pixels, the same permutation to every test and training case, the results of our algorithm wouldn't change. That's clearly not true for something like a convolutional net. A convolutional net's been told something about the task. By applying this fixed permutation, we destroy all simple ways of telling the net something about the spatial structure of the task. So if you apply standard backpropagation, it's hard to do better than 1.6% errors. John Platt and myself have both tried quite hard applying standard backpropagation with various different architectures, and we're both quite good at doing it. You can actually beat 1.6% by using constraints on the incoming weight vectors of the hidden units. If you use an appropriate restriction on the length of an incoming weight vector, you can do a bit better than 1.6%. Support vector machines can get 1.4%. And this was one of the pieces of evidence that led to support vector machines supplanting backpropagation. If you pre-train a network using a stack of Boltzmann machines, and then you fine tune it to be better at generating the joint density of digits and image labels, then you can get down to 1.25%. If you train a stack of Boltzmann machines and simply put a 10-way softmax on top and fine-tune it, you can get to 1.15%. And with more fiddling around, you can get that down to about 1%. So you can do a lot better than standard backpropagation, and also better than support vector machines, by using generative pre-training followed by discriminative fine-tuning. Marc Aurelio Ranzato, working in Jan Lacan's group, also showed, using a slightly different pre-training method, that pre-training helps for models that have more data and better priors. So they used an additional 60,000 distorted digit images, so they had a lot more training data. They also used a convolutional multilayer neural network, and Jan's group is the best group at tuning those. With backpropagation alone, they managed to get down to 0.49%. When they did the unsupervised layer-by-layer -layer pre training followed by backpropagation, they got down to 0.39%, which at the time was a record. So you may remember this picture from the first lecture. This was one of the examples I gave of the success of neural nets. It's the same picture. And back then, I said we could get down to 20.7%, by pre-training and then fine-tuning with backpropagation, and that the previous and that the previous speaker independent record on Timit was 24.4%, which actually required averaging several models. Li Deng at Microsoft Research picked up on this result immediately and collaborated on improving it. And this has led to a big change 
in speech recognition. If you look at this news story, it will refer you to a blog where the chief research officer for Microsoft is talking about the big improvements in speech recognition caused by using deep neural nets. In this video, we'll look in more detail at what happens when a neural network is discriminatively fine-tuned after it's first been pre-trained as a stack of Boltzmann machines. What we'll see is that the weights in the lower layers hardly change at all, but that nevertheless these tiny changes make a big difference in the classification performance of the neural net because they put the decision boundaries in the right places. We'll also see that the effect of pre-training is to make deeper networks more effective than shallower ones. Without pre-training, it's often the other way around. Finally, I'll give a fairly general argument about why it makes sense to start by doing generative training and only after this is well underway to consider discriminative training. So now we're going to look at some work done in Yoshio Benjo's lab examining what happens during fine-tuning after a net's been generatively pre-trained. If you look on the left, there's the receptive fields in the first hidden layer of feature detectors after the generative pre-training but before the fine-tuning. Then on the right, there's the same receptive fields after the fine-tuning and you'll see almost nothing has changed. Nevertheless, the changes helped with discrimination. Here's an example of how pre-training reduces the test errors for networks with one hidden layer. The task was discriminating between digits in a very large set of distorted digits. And you can see that after the backpropagation fine-tuning, the networks with pre-training almost always did better than the networks without pre-training. The effect gets even bigger if you use deeper networks. So here you can see that there's basically no overlap between the two distributions. And the deep networks with pre-training have got better than the shallow networks. And the deep networks without pre-training have got worse than the shallow networks. This is showing you the classification error and the variation in classification error as you change the number of layers when you're not doing pre-training. And you can see that two layers appears to be best, and by the time you've got four layers, you're doing considerably worse. By contrast, if you use pre-training, four layers is better than two layers, there's much less variation, and the errors are lower. This is a visualization made with TSNI of what happens to the weights during training for both pre-trained and non-pre-trained networks. And they're all plotted in the same space, but you can see they form two distinct classes of networks. The ones at the top are networks without pre-training, and the ones at the bottom are networks with pre-training. Each point shows a model in function space. It's no use comparing weight vectors, because two nets might differ by having two of the hidden units swapped round, so they'd behave exactly the same way, but the weights would look very different. In order to compare network, you have to compare the functions that they're implementing. And a way to do that is to have a suite of test cases and look at the outputs the networks produce on those test cases and then concatenate those outputs into one great long vector. So if two networks produce very similar outputs on all the test cases, that concatenated vector will be very similar for the two networks. Now you take those concatenated output vectors and you plot those in 2D using TSNI. The colors show the stages of training. So if you look at the networks at the top, there's an initial blob in dark blue, and then you can see those all move in roughly the same direction. In other words, the networks after one epoch of learning are all more similar to one another than they are to the initial networks. That's even more pronounced with the pre-trained networks at the bottom. So the color tells you which epoch you're in, the trajectories at the top without pre-training show that different networks end up in different places in function space and they're quite widely spread. The trajectories at the bottom show that with pre-training you end up in a quite different region of function space and the networks tend to be more similar to one another. 
But the main point is there's no overlap. The kinds of solutions you find, if you pre-train the networks generatively, are just qualitatively different from the kinds of solutions you find if you start with small random weights. The last thing I want to say in this video is to explain why pre-training makes sense. So let's imagine that the way we generated pairs of an image and a label was by taking the stuff in the real world, using that to generate an image, for example by taking a photograph or something, and then having generated the image we attached a label to it that didn't depend on the stuff in the world. So contingent on the image itself, the stuff in the world is irrelevant. The label just depends on the pixels in the image. That would be the case, for example, if the label told us whether the top left pixel was similar to the bottom right pixel. Now if we generated images that way, then it would make sense to try and learn a mapping from images to labels because the labels depend directly on the images. But actually, it's more plausible that the way we generate image label pairs are by there being stuff in the world that gives rise to an image. And the reason the image has the name it has is because of the stuff in the world, not because of the pixels in the image. So you see a cow, you take a photograph, and you call that a photograph of a cow because you were looking at a cow when you took it. Now the point is, there's a high bandwidth from the stuff in the world to the image. And there's a low bandwidth from the stuff in the world to the label. For example, if I just say cow, you don't know whether the cow was upside down, whether it was brown or black and white, whether it was alive or dead, how big it was, what else was in the image, whether it was facing you or facing away from you. All of those things aren't conveyed by the label. If you see an image with thousands and thousands of pixels, you typically know all of those things. You get much, much more information about the causes of an image by looking at the image than you do by looking at the label of the image. So in that situation, where there's a high bandwidth pathway from the world to the image, and a low bandwidth pathway from the world to the label, because the label typically contains very few bits, it makes much more sense to try and recover the label by first inverting the high bandwidth pathway to get back to the stuff in the world that caused the image and then having recovered the stuff in the world that caused the image to decide what label it would be given. So that's a much more plausible model of how we assign names to things in images and that justifies having a pre-training phase where you try and go from the image to its underlying causes followed by a discriminative phase where you try and go from those underlying causes to the label and perhaps you slightly fine-tune the mapping from the image to the underlying causes. In this video I'm going to describe how to use an RBM to model real valued data. The idea is that we make the visible units instead of being binary stochastic units be linear units with Gaussian noise. When we do this, we get problems with learning. And it turns out a good solution to those problems is to then make the hidden units be rectified linear units. With linear Gaussian units for the visibles and rectified linear units for the hiddens, it's quite easy to learn a restricted Boltzmann machine that makes a good model of real valued data. We first used restricted Boltzmann machines with images of handwritten digits. For those images, Intermediate intensities caused by a pixel being only partially inked can be modelled quite well by probabilities, that is numbers between 1 and 0 that are actually the probability of a logistic unit being on. So we treat partially inked pixels as having a probability of being inked. This is incorrect but it works quite well. However, it won't work for real images. In a real image, the intensity of a pixel is almost always, almost exactly, the average of its neighbours. So it's got a very high probability of being very close to that average and a very small probability of being a little further away. And you can't achieve that with a logistic unit. Mean field logistic units are unable to represent things like the intensity is 0.69 but very unlikely to be 0.71 or 0.67. So we need some other kind of unit. The obvious thing to use is a linear unit with Gaussian noise. 
So we model pixels as Gaussian variables. We can still use alternating Gibbs sampling to run the Markov chain required for contrastive divergence learning. But we need to use a much smaller learning rate, otherwise it will tend to blow up. The equation looks like this. The first term on the right-hand side is a kind of parabolic containment function that stops things blowing up. So the term in that sum contributed by the ith visible unit is parabolic in shape. It looks like this. It's a parabola with its minimum at the bias of the ith unit. And as the ith unit departs from that value, we add energy quadratically. So that tries to keep the ith visible unit close to bi. The interactive term between the visible and the hidden units looks like this. And if you differentiate that with respect to vi, you can see that you get a constant. It's the sum over all j of hj wij divided by sigma i. So that term, with its constant gradient, looks like this. And when you add together that top-down contribution to the energy, as linear, and the parabolic containment function, you'll get a parabolic function, but with the mean shifted away from bi, and how much it's shifted depends on the slope of that blue line. So the effect of the hidden units is just to push the mean to one side. It's easy to write down an energy function like this, and it's easy to take derivatives of it, but when we try learning with it, we often get problems. There were a lot of reports in the literature that people could not get these Gaussian binary RBMs to work. And it is indeed extremely hard to learn tight variances for the visible units. It took us a long time to figure out why it's so hard to learn those visible variances. This picture helps. If you consider the effect that visible unit i has on hidden unit j, when visible unit i has a small standard deviation, sigma i, that has the effect of exaggerating the bottom-up weights. That's because we need to measure the activity of i in units of its standard deviation. So when the standard deviation is small, we need to multiply the weight by a lot. If you look at the top-down effect of j on i, that's multiplied by sigma i. So when the standard deviation of a visible unit i is very small, the bottom-up effects get exaggerated, and the top-down effects get attenuated. The result is that we have a conflict where either we have bottom-up effects that are much too big or top-down effects that are much too small. And the result is that the hidden units tend to saturate and be firmly on or off all the time. And this will mess up learning. So the solution is to have many more hidden units than visible units. That allows small weights between the visible and hidden units to have big top-down effects because there's so many hidden units. But of course, we really need the number of hidden units to change as that standard deviation sigma i gets smaller. And on the next slide, we'll see how we can achieve that. I'm going to introduce stepped sigmoid units. The idea is we make many copies of each stochastic binary hidden unit. All the copies have the same weights and the same bias that's learned, b, but in addition to that adaptive bias, b, they have a fixed offset to the bias. The first unit has an offset of minus 0.5. The second unit has an offset of minus 1.5. The third one has an offset of minus 2.5, and so on. If you have a whole family of sigmoid units like that, with the bias changed by one between neighboring members of the family, the response curve looks like this. If the total input x is very low, none of them are turned on. As x increases, the number that get turned on increases linearly. This means that as the standard deviation on the previous slide gets smaller, the number of copies of each hidden unit that get turned on gets bigger, and we achieve just the effect we wanted, which is we get more top-down effect to drive these visible units that have small standard deviations. Now it's quite expensive to use a big population of binary stochastic units with offset biases, because for each one of them, we need to put the total input through the logistic function. But we can make some fast approximations which work just as well. So the sum of the activities of a whole bunch of sigmoid units with offset biases, which is what's shown in that summation, is approximately equal 
to log of 1 plus e to the x. And that in turn is approximately equal to the maximum of 0 and x. And we can add some noise to the x if we want. So the first term in the equation looks like this. The second term looks like that. And you can see that the sum of all those sigmoids in the first term will be a curve like that. And we can approximate that by a linear threshold unit that has a value of 0 unless it's above threshold, in which case its value increases linearly with its input. Contrastive divergence learning works well for the sum of a bunch of stochastic logistic units with offset biases. And in that case, you get a noise variance that's equal to the logistic function of the output of that sum. Alternatively, we can use that green curve and use rectified linear units. They're much faster to compute because we don't need to go through the logistic many times. And contrast divergence works just fine with those. One nice property of rectified linear units is that if they have a bias of zero, they exhibit scale equivariance. This is a very nice property to have for images. What scale equivariance means is that if you take an image x and you multiply all the pixel intensities by a scalar, a, then the representation of ax in the rectified linear units will be just a times the representation of x. In other words, when we scale up all the intensities in the image, we scale up the activities of all the hidden units, but all the ratios stay the same. Rectified linear units aren't fully linear, because if you add together two images, the representation you get is not the sum of the representations of each image separately. This property of scale equivariance is quite similar to the property of translational equivariance that convolutional nets have. So if we ignore the pooling for now, in a convolutional net, if we shift an image and look at the representation, the representation of a shifted image is just a shifted version of the representation of the unshifted image. So in a convolutional net without pooling, translations of the input just flow through the layers of the net without really affecting anything. The representation at every layer is just translated. In this video, I'm going to talk about some advanced material. It's not really appropriate for a first course on neural networks, but I know that some of you are particularly interested in the origins of deep learning, and the content of this video is mathematically very pretty, so I couldn't resist putting it in. UIT's insight that stacking up restricted Boltzmann machines gives you something like a sigmoid belief net can actually be seen without doing any math just by noticing that a restricted Boltzmann machine is actually the same thing as an infinitely deep sigmoid belief net with shared weights. Once again, weight sharing leads to something very interesting. I'm now going to describe a very interesting explanation of why layer by layer learning works. It depends on the fact that there's an equivalence between restricted Boltzmann machines, which are undirected models with symmetric connections, and infinitely deep directed networks in which every layer uses the same weight matrix. This equivalence also gives insight into why contrastive divergence learning works. So an RBM is really just an infinitely deep sigmoid belief net with a lot of shared weights. The Markov chain that we run when we want to sample from an RBM can be viewed as exactly the same thing as a sigmoid belief net. So here's the picture. We have a very deep sigmoid belief net, in fact infinitely deep. We use the same weights at every layer. We have to have all the V layers being the same size as each other and all the H layers being the same size as each other. But V and H can be different sizes. The distribution generated by this very deep network with replicated weights is exactly the equilibrium distribution that you get by alternating between doing P of V given H and P of H given V, where both P of V given H and P of H given V are defined by the same weight matrix W. And that's exactly what you do when you take a restricted Boltzmann machine and run a Markov chain to get a sample from the equilibrium distribution. So a top-down pass starting infinitely high up in this directed net is exactly equivalent to letting a restricted Boltzmann machine settle to equilibrium. They therefore define the same distribution. The sample that you get at v0 if you run this infinite directed net 
will be an equilibrium sample of the equivalent RBM. Now let's look at inference in an infinitely deep sigmoid belief net. So in inference, we start at v0, and then we have to infer the state of h0. Normally this would be a difficult thing to do because of explaining away. If, for example, hidden units k and j both had big positive weights to visible unit i, then we would expect that when we observe that i is on, k and j become anti-correlated in the posterior distribution. That's explaining away. However, in this net, k and j are completely independent of one another when we do inference given v0. So the inference is trivial. We just multiply v0 by the transpose of w and put whatever we get through the logistic sigmoid and then sample. And that gives us binary states for the units in h0. But the question is, how could they possibly be independent given explaining away? The answer to that question is that the model above h0 implements what I call a complementary prior. It implements a prior distribution of h0 that exactly cancels out the correlations in explaining away. So for the example shown, the prior will implement positive correlations between k and j. Explaining away will cause negative correlations, and those will exactly cancel. So what's really going on is that when we multiply v0 by the transpose of the weights, we're not just computing the likelihood term, we're computing the product of a likelihood term and a prior term. And that's what you need to do to get the posterior. It normally comes as a big surprise to people that when you multiply by W transpose, it's the product of the prior and the posterior you're computing. So what's happening in this net is that the complementary prior implemented by all the stuff above H0 exactly cancels out explaining away and makes inference very simple. And that's true at every layer of this net. So we can do inference for every layer and get an unbiased sample at each layer simply by multiplying v0 by w transpose. Then once we've computed the binary state of h0, we multiply that by w, put that through the logistic sigmoid and sample, and that will give us a binary state for v1, and so on all the way up. So just as generating from this model is equivalent to running the alternating Markov chain of a restricted Boltzmann machine to equilibrium, Performing inference in this model is exactly the same process in the opposite direction. This is a very special kind of sigmoid belief net in which inference is as easy as generation. So here I've shown the generative weights that define the model and also their transposes that are the way we do inference. And now what I want to show is how we get the Boltzmann machine learning algorithm out of the learning algorithm for directed sigmoid belief nets. So the learning rule for a sigmoid belief net says that we should first get a sample from the posterior. That's what the SJ and SI are, they're samples from the posterior distribution. And then we should change a weight, a generative weight, in proportion to the product of the presynaptic activity, SJ, and the difference between the postsynaptic activity, SI, and the probability of turning on i, given all the binary states of the layer that sj is in. Now if we ask how do we compute pi, something very interesting happens. If you look at inference in this network on the right, we first infer a binary state for h0. Once we've chosen that binary state, we then infer a binary state for v1 by multiplying h0 by w putting the results to the logistic, and then sampling. So if you think about how SI1 was generated, it was a sample from what we get if we put H0 through the weight matrix W, and then through the logistic. And that's exactly what we'd have to do in order to compute PI0. We'd have to take the binary activities in H0, and going downwards now through the green weights w, we will compute the probability of turning on unit i given the binary states of its parents. So the point is the process that goes from h0 to v1 is identical to the process that goes from h0 to v0 and so si1 is an unbiased sample of pi0.
that means we can replace it in the learning rule. So we end up with a learning rule that looks like this, because since we have replicated weights, each of those lines is the term in the learning rule that comes from one of those green weight matrices. For the first green weight matrix here, the learning rule is the presynaptic state, Sj0, times the difference between the postsynaptic state, Si0, and the probability that the binary states in H0 would turn on Si, which we could call Pi0, but a sample with that probability is Si1. And so an unbiased estimate of the derivative can be got by plugging in Si1 on that first line of the learning rule. Similarly, for the second weight matrix, the learning rule is Si1 into Sj0 minus Pj0, and an unbiased estimate of Pj0 is Sj1. And so that's an unbiased estimate of the learning rule for this second weight matrix. And if you just keep going for all the weight matrices, you get this infinite series, and all the terms except the very first term and the very last term cancel out. And so you end up with the Boltzmann machine learning rule, which is just Sj0 into Si0 minus Sj infinity into Si infinity. So let's go back and look at how we would learn an infinitely deep sigmoid belief net. We would start by making all the weight matrices the same. So we tie all the weight matrices together, and we learn using those tied weights. Now that's exactly equivalent to learning a restricted Boltzmann machine. The diagram on the right and the diagram on the left are identical. We can think of the symmetric arrow in the diagram on the left as just a convenient shorthand for an infinite directed net with tied weights. So we first learn that restricted Boltzmann machine. Now we ought to learn it using maximum likelihood learning but actually we're just going to use contrastive divergence learning. We're going to take a shortcut. Once we've learned the first restricted Boltzmann machine, what we could do is we could freeze the bottom level weights. We'll freeze the generative weights that define the model. We'll also freeze the weights we're going to use for inference to be the transpose of those generative weights. So we freeze those weights. We keep all the other weights tied together, but now we're going to allow them to be different from the weights in the bottom layer but they're still all tied together. So learning the remaining weights tied together is exactly equivalent to learning another restricted Boltzmann machine, namely a restricted Boltzmann machine with H0 as its visible units, V1 as its hidden units, and where the data is the aggregated posterior across H0. That is, if we want to sample a data vector to train this network, what we do is we put in a real data vector at v0, we do inference through those frozen weights, and we get a binary vector at h0, and we treat that as data for training the next restricted Boltzmann machine. And we can go up for as many layers as we like, and when we get fed up, we just end up with a restricted Boltzmann machine at the top, which is equivalent to saying all the weights in the infinite directed net above there are still tied together, but the weights below have now all become different. Now, our explanation of why the inference procedure was correct involved the idea of a complementary prior created by the weights in the layers above. And of course, when we change the weights in the layers above, but leave the bottom layer of weights fixed, the prior created by those changed weights is no longer exactly complementary. So now, our inference procedure, using the frozen weights in the bottom layer, is no longer exactly correct. The good news is, it's nearly always very close to correct, and with the incorrect inference procedure, we still get a variational bound on the log probability of the data. The higher layers have changed because they've learned a prior for the bottom hidden layer that's closer to the aggregated posterior distribution, and that makes the model better. So changing the hidden weights makes the inference that we're doing at the bottom hidden layer incorrect, but gives us a better model. And if you look at those two effects, we proved that the improvement that you get in the variational bound from having a better model is always greater than the loss that you get from inference being slightly incorrect. So in this variational bound, you win when you learn the weights in higher layers, assuming you do it with correct maximum likelihood learning. So now let's go back to what's happening in contrastive divergence learning. 
we have the infinite net on the right, and we have a restricted Boltzmann machine on the left, and they're equivalent. If we were to do maximum likelihood learning for the restricted Boltzmann machine, it would be maximum likelihood learning for the infinite sigmoid belief net. But what we're going to do is we're going to cut things off. We're going to ignore the small derivatives for the weights you get in the higher layers of the infinite sigmoid belief net. So we cut it off where that dotted red line is. And now if we look at the derivatives, the derivatives we're going to get look like this. They've got two terms. The first term comes from that bottom layer of weights. And we've seen that before. The derivative for that bottom layer of weights is just the first line here. The second line comes from the next layer of weights. That's this line here. We need to compute the activities in H1 in order to compute the SJ1 in that second line. But we're not actually computing derivatives for the third layer of weights. And when we take those first two terms and we combine them, we get exactly the learning rule for one-step contrastive divergence. So what's going on in contrastive divergence is we're combining weight derivatives for the lower layers and ignoring the weight derivatives in higher layers. The question is, why can we get away with ignoring those higher derivatives? When the weights are small, the Markov chain mixes very fast. If the weights are zero, it mixes in one step. And if the Markov chain mixes fast, the higher layers will be close to the equilibrium distribution, i.e. they will have forgotten what the input was at the bottom layer. And now we have a nice property. If the higher layers are sampled from the equilibrium distribution, we know that the derivatives of the log probability of the data with respect to the weights must average out to zero. And that's because the current weights in the model are a perfect model of the equilibrium distribution. The equilibrium distribution is generated using those weights. And if you want to generate samples from the equilibrium distribution, those are the best possible weights you could have. So we know the derivatives there are zero. As the weights get larger, we might have to run more iterations of contrastive divergence, which corresponds to taking into account more layers of that infinite sigmoid belief net. That will allow contrastive divergence to continue to be a good approximation to maximum likelihood. And so if we're trying to learn a density model, that makes a lot of sense. As the weights grow, you run CD for more and more steps. If there's a statistician around, you give him a guarantee, then in the infinite limit, you'll run CD for infinitely many steps. And then you have an asymptotic convergence result, which is the thing that keeps statisticians happy. Of course, it's completely irrelevant because you'll never reach a point like that. There is, however, an interesting point here. If our purpose in using CD is to build a stack of restricted bolts machines that learn multiple layers of features, it turns out that we don't need a good approximation to maximum likelihood. For learning multiple layers of features, CD1 is just fine. In fact, it's probably better than doing maximum likelihood. 